Let's get this project started. You missed the dancing, so be happy you only got singing. So <laughs> for this ring, we're going to be using a 14 gauge rectangular wire. 14 gauge is 1.626 millimeters, and this is four millimeters wide. Rio Grande sells this, and this is the item number at Rio. Um, so as you can see, there's math on the paper, and I do do so apologize, but it's imperative. First thing we want to do is we get our little strip out of which you will need, depending on what size ring you make. Of course, I'm making a size 10, which is big. It's going on this finger here. I need 67 millimeters of this, and I'm going to tell you how I came up with that fabulous number. I have a chart on my website that shows the interior diameter of all ring sizes. Well, not all, as many as I could handle. So what, what you want to do is go to that chart, and I will have a link in the video description, uh, and find out what your internal dimensions are for your size. Then you're going to add, this is your metal thickness here, that, and you're going to come up with this number. Calculator time. <laughs> Take this number, multiply it by an abbreviated version of pi, which is 3.145. It's not pi. Pi goes on for infinity but we're cutting it short here. And that it gives me 66.76. I'm gonna round this up to 67 because I'm gonna leave a little extra wiggle room for miter cutting vicing the end that I'm gonna cut off. Uh, so that said, this is gonna go into the miter cutting vise pronto and I'm gonna get this end all squared up. The next thing after that is, I'm gonna to try to straighten this a little bit and then I'm gonna mark out my 67 millimeters. Don't forget on the miter cutting vise, you wanna file until the file slips off the metal. And I like to go from a very rough file to like a habilis file, which is a little bigger than a needle file. And then I go to a needle file because each grit of cutting teeth of the files uh, get finer and finer and, and you'll be surprised how much you can take off with the uh, needle file at the end and then hit it with sandpaper just to make a party because we don't want burrs or striations striations or anything that's going to get in the way of soldering the two ends of the ring shank together first thing you want to do when you're done with the miter cutting vise is remove those burrs both sides top and bottom and both edges and just take it flat on the sandpaper so you keep nice square edges here no burrs remember bad burrs bad burrs all right so i'm gonna try to straighten this up a little bit um one thing you can do is tape down your ruler it helps to hold things in place if you're having issues which i probably will but i'm not gonna tape it down because i'm lazy all right, 67, double check. This is a little bigger. You want it right on 67. And there's my mark. Let's see if my shears will work or I'll have to saw this. I don't know, remember what the limit is on these Swanstrom shears. Okay, that happens. <laughs> no, I think 18 gauge might be it. So I'm gonna saw this here. I like to use my tube cutter. I had, to I had to take off the stop on it though. Metal's too long. This helps to keep you honest and keep your cut cleaner. All right, so now the end that I just sawed is gonna go into the vise to get squared up. Quarter a millimeter or so sticking up there. Make sure to double check that you don't have any gaps on either side of that little pin tooth. And then once again, remove your burrs. Okay, that looks like a beautiful ring shank blank. So I am ready to go over and form this on my jump ring. Not my jump ring. Oh, for God's sakes, ring mandrel. All right, so this is a 10. So I'm going to start it on the 9 bend my ends 
but I'm flipping it, remember, because this is a cone. Can I hammer with my left hand? Sort of. Okay, so now I have a start here, and I'm gonna start forming on the nine. So over here. Okay, this needs more hammering here. I don't know if you can tell or not. Actually, it looks pretty good. It's pretty even. Um, now we're going to start tapping down on this. Let's get a little more. All right, that looks beautiful. This is ready, ready to roll. Not round, but ready to roll for soldering. I thought that I, what I would do is throw out some uh, variants, uh, design variants for the bridge. Um, this one I've blended into the, the shank beneath. This is, has just a square edge on it. You could do the square edge that's more like this one, or you could round it like this. And this one is shaped into a V. You could do any kind of fancy shape on here. This could be split and filed into points. Um, I don't know. I don't have a very creative brain right now, so I'm just not gonna say anything. You can figure out your own designs. But um, the one thing I did wanna mention, because we are using material that's both four millimeters wide, when you're soldering this on, you can just lay it flat on the soldering block, which makes, and put your solder here and here, which makes it much, much easier to solder. This little pointy guy, on the other hand, is a real pain because he's arced here, curved here, and this laying it on its side did not work. Also, um, and I didn't do a very good job of this, it should be centered on the shank, and it slipped while I was soldering, but hey. That's another thing to think of. You'll need to scribe a line in the center, make your point match. You'll need to have these balanced. So this V shape is a much more challenging shape, uh, both in the construction the placement and then in the soldering. So I think they all work equally as well, although this is probably my favorite. And this would be fun with some pierced elements in here, but don't make it too thin because remember it is holding your setting. So those are my design ideas. Another thing you wanna make sure is that you know where your solder seam is. You wanna keep that at the back on the bottom for two reasons. Uh, one is in the future, if someone wants to size this ring, it's better to saw through an old solder join than it is to like add a new one here and a new one here. So if you keep the same solder join and you keep it so it's accessible to another jeweler, that's a great idea. And the other reason to keep the um, seam down here is so that if you're overheating a little bit too much up here that your join does not open up because there is no join. So those are little notes, notes from the bench. For the next part, we're going to be using 18 gauge, four millimeter wide sterling or any kind of other, any other kind of metal you want strip. You want a miter cutting vise the end so it's pretty. You want to have three centimeters and you want to mark center at one and a half too. Mark at zero and then at one and a half. So we're gonna keep this handle on here, this part here, while we go over and form it on a ring mandrel. Now the ring I'm making is a 10. So if you're, let's say you're making an eight, you want to start shaping at around seven. You want to bring the ring with you over to wherever you're mandrel is. So I'm going to start here at nine and I'm going to hammer past this line. Once you've 
created a curve past your little line here. I'm just going to use these Swanstrom shears with the flush end facing my piece. So now we can check how it sits on top of our shank. This is, this is too exact. I want this to stick up a little bit. So that means we need to go maybe to an eight. Don't forget you want to flip it over. So we can check again. Hopefully we have a little gap up there. And the reason we marked in the middle there is so that we can line those two marks up. It's so right about there is where we want it. And that is going to measure from the top of the ring shank to the bottom of the top arc. What is that? I'll measure at the line. One and a half millimeter gap. Because what we're going to be doing is we're going to solder these ends, this end and this end over here on. And we're going to cut through this and we're going to stick the bezel in here. And this is going to hold the bezel. So to do these rounded edges, it really helps to have a ring clamp to hold this. Okay, so you're gonna just take your file and start curling it around the point. So I don't know if you can see, but there is a faint line here. This is four millimeter and I set my dividers at two millimeter and drag them. And this way, if I wanted to do the V shape at this point, draw a line up from the V, from the point here. So this would be my guideline for doing a V shape at this point. But I'm gonna stick with this. And I'm gonna switch to a smaller file, kind of clean up the marks. I'm gonna get rid of this, it's distracting me. Just gonna run it around a little bit, take off any little points on the blend on the bend and then hit it with some sandpaper there we go voila Okay, so the bigger piece of metal is the ring, so that gets the most heat. Just concentrate on one spot, trying to heat both pieces of metal up at the same temperature at the same time. We got a little flow there, aiming it at the area, mostly on the ring shank. Okay, and that flow too. So you want to flip this over, not when it's red hot because it'll fall apart. And we may have to put more solder on this joint. I'm going to hit it with some flux. See if we can bring any of that solder up to this side. Okay, Ooh, that was close. So after I pickle this, I'm gonna check it out, make sure that I have sufficient amount of solder. I don't want any lines or divots in there. So what you can do if you want to check that you actually are on center is measure a little flexi ruler like this and measure from the center down to the point of the bridge, uh, and they should be equal on both sides. I lucked out, and I am. Miracle! I had a heck of a time getting my double stick tape to stick, so I had to rough up the surface. So I'm re-scribing my line there. Hopefully the tape will stick. I have it highly polished so oh, it wasn't working so we're going to try it again this is the double stick tape and my sharpay drawing around it so i have an idea where to cut okay that's good enough probably didn't have to go to all this elaborate kindergarten project here but i did okay we're on there how to place this on center as close as close as we can get and look look down and make sure that your little triangles on each end are equal and that this is centered on your line. This actually looks pretty good. I lucked out. And now we're going to scribe. Okay, that's one side. 
Okay, with any luck, I can see the lines. Okay, can you see them? So here's my two arcs. I'm gonna have to cut straight though because I have to come in from the top. I don't have enough wiggle room underneath to be able to cut from behind. That's the next project is to cut this shape out. I'm going to come in from the top, saw top down. First, I'm going to make a groove to keep the saw blade in. Watch your fingers. So I'm almost all the way cut through on these. I should put this in a vise. My fingers are getting sore. Okay, that's through. And that's through. Okay, so there's our cut. And these shoulders are really too low, so I'm gonna pick them up a little bit. Because I don't know if there is a word for these things, so I'm calling it the bridge and the arms. Okay, so you wanna make sure that you're level across here. Hopefully you can find your setting. I'm gonna check our fit and it's too small, which is excellent. I don't want it too big. What you do is you lift the arms to create more space and you lower the arms to decrease the space. So if I have to lower, if I cut too much and had to lower the space, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be good for me. I would not be happy. I've got little saw marks on here. That's not good. I'm worried about the little marks on the side here because the ones on the interior you won't see. Probably can just clean this up on some sandpaper. I think I'm going to finish what I'm doing and then do that. So we need to find some ball burrs right now. I'm gonna be using three ball burrs. And what the ball burrs are gonna do is they're gonna act like carving tools. I'm gonna to carve out the arcs in here. Hopefully not carving it so much that the setting no longer fits. One of the ways we can determine which ball burr to use is to put one on the inside of the bezel and it should be a snug fit but not huge we're not going to be drilling in here this is just for it's cho choosing the size so i'm going to start with a smaller burr a 3.8 then i'm going to move up to a 4.3 and then finally i'll move up to the five millimeter ball burr i've switched over to my grs gravers block or balls lubrication for this burr using blade butter from pepe tools which i love i'm gonna carefully come in here try to control this cut on this side now and keep it in the center it really wants to roll so just a fyi so we're starting to develop the arc. So I'm going to move to the 4.3. And you can use like a 4.0 or 4.5 burr. That's what you've got. Let me get the blade butter off the floor. Same process. I'm going to try to stay on center. I'm going to try to be really careful so that I don't move. I mean, not move. Let it roll around the ring. Go slow. It'll give you more control. Okay, I'm going to switch to the bad boy. Numero cinco. There's a point right here that I don't want. I'm going to take my marks off so this is easier to see. So what I want to do is to have both of these points at the same line. This one is too tall right here. Take it down a bit. You're like carving right now. Okay, let's clean this up and check our fit. You can try lifting the arms up first if you've got the room for it. If yours is too high, then maybe you need to think about doing something else. It's really, really close. So I'm gonna carve just a little more, a little bit on both sides. And it should be pretty tight. I want this thing to be held in. 
place by the arms of the bridge. I'm gonna go perpendicular. Okay, there we go. It's in to make sure it's where I want it. So you can put this wherever you want it too. You can have it like halfway up or what I'm doing is putting it down at the bottom. Like I said, whatever you want to do, as long as it fits and is level and everything's pretty. Bevel. Let's turn these down here. Make sure this is on center too. Yeah, you want to make sure you check the sides too. Everything should be perpendicular. The setting should be perpendicular to the shank. All right, I think that's better. Let's solder the little darling and call this part done. Remember to think about thickness of metal. Keep the tip of the torch on the heavier metal, which is the shoulder. To drag the solder around the edge of the bezel, you'll need to drag also your torch tip, but remember to keep the blue part of the flame on the shoulder, not on the setting. Okay, now we're gonna move on to the other side. I would always keep an eye on that bezel, even though you may not have your torch tip there. It just takes a second and it's destroyed. Well, that looks good, but keep your fingers crossed at all times. There are a zillion different ways to polish this up. Um, hopefully you've done some polishing throughout so you don't have tons to do, but I was thought I'd show you a couple of the methods, a couple of the tools actually. These are great for inside rings. The only thing I don't like about them is that they are not uh, the 332nd inch shanks. So I have to use my regular flex shaft uh, handle instead of my quick change while this is here. Uh, this can also be used. These are aggressive. This one is a particularly aggressive barrels. Uh, they come, you can get pumice or you can get silicone. Here's a set of silicone. Anyway, they come in varying widths and sizes, and they also have knife edge, so you can get into really tight little spots, like in here. There are, these are called polishing pins, I believe. These can also be sharpened. I'll show you how to do that. This one is pumice, this companion here. This is a little rougher than this one. Uh, so there's a variety of different finishing tools. You can use bristle discs. These get stacked. I, I've found that a minimum of three of these stacked together works well. This is a more aggressive. And then when it comes down to polishing, there are, this is a felt, uh, whatever this is called, a mini barrel or something. You can also use cotton buffs with your polishing compound. If you want a matte finish, this is a, there's a bunch of scrubby brushes that are great. They're really inexpensive. I'll have a link to them. Uh, on, Amazon is where I usually get mine because you can get a big bag. Or nada for very little. Uh, so I'm going to show you how to sh sharpen these and refresh these. So my hand file, another use for hand files. So this one has been run along something that's taken out the middle. And if I want to use this on the inside of my ring, I want to even this out. And you don't want to use your best files for this because it will destroy the little teefies. And this is the same concept where you're going to run this down on your file, create a nice gently sloping point. Of course, you go through them quicker when you do this, but you got to shape them. It's just so much easier when they're nice. So basically, you're going to go over your ring and take out any flat spots. This has a little flat spot here, so that little this little uh, knife edge will be really good for taking out this weird thing. And it's good for cleaning up around these little areas here in case you have some solder. You'll want to wear magnification. Even if you don't need magnification, wear magnification. 
And the other thing that you can do is zoom in really, really closely with your camera or your phone and you'll see all kinds of stuff that you just makes you kind of gag. <laughs> uh, it's better on the photos part, of, at least with the iPhone, which zooms in a lot closer than the camera does. So anyway, I'm going to continue to polish this. And like I said, you've got inside stuff and you've got outside stuff. So use them wisely. Oh, and I almost forgot, really important, wear a mask, please. I care about you. Just like with sanding, you're going to want to go through your grits. So start out, if you need it, with the most aggressive. You might be able to get away with not using the most aggressive uh, and go to like the second. Most of these polishers have a little chart that tells you, you know, what the grit is and work your way to the finest. Uh, and then you can move in at that point with some kind of buffing. You can use a buffing wheel or you can use a little, in, these in your flex shaft. And I always like to, if I want, I'm going for super shiny, I like to tumble afterwards. Just make sure if you're tumbling and you've got a stone that can be damaged or scratched by steel, look at the Mohs chart. You'll want to do that type of the finishing before you set your stone. The, the CZs are totally fine in CZs and diamonds and sapphires are okay in the tumbler. So anyway, that's it real briefly on finishing. Thanks for joining me today on making these little darlings. And uh, as I said earlier, the last video in this series, we will be setting the marquee into the ring. Thanks again. This is Nancy LT Hamilton. Ciao. Where's my hand? I can't find it. There it is. Bye. <laughs>